will look at the economic dimensions of the United States' efforts in Afghanistan. Afghanistan's stability will depend in large part on what the United States, our partners and allies, and most critically, the Afghans themselves, do over the coming several years to bring economic progress to a population ravaged by 30 years of war. Observers note that the Taliban originally secured a foothold in Afghanistan in part because severe poverty continually dashed hopes for a better life. For the average Afghan, life was simply getting worse with no good prospects for improvement anytime soon. The Afghan central government was unable to provide even the most basic services like electricity and potable water. Justice was either slow, arbitrary, or non-existent. Unemployment topped 50 percent, and police were either absent or corrupt. Roads and irrigation canals had fallen into disrepair, and the once productive agricultural base was so severely degraded that farmers, to make a decent living, chose to grow poppies rather than traditional products like wheat, dates, and pomegranates. In short, following the Soviet withdrawal, the Taliban offered a different, albeit tyrannical, vision for Afghans, increasingly wary of endless conflict and growing personal insecurity. And while the, the average Afghan was not supportive of the Taliban per se, the post-Soviet era was so adverse that the Taliban were able to find a toehold and eventually a safe haven. After the fall of the Taliban and the arrival of the United States and NATO, there's been a modest economic gain. Afghanistan has experienced rapid growth on the strength of the international donor community, especially the United States as its largest donor. More than $2.4 billion in new investment has been registered since 2003, two-thirds of which represent public investment finance through donor aid and one-third foreign direct investment. As a result, in 2008, in terms of the GDP growth rate, Afghanistan ranked 24th out of 231 countries, with a 2008 real gross domestic product growth rate of 7.5%. Unfortunately, at present, this silver lining does not obscure the dark and ominous cloud over Afghanistan's economy. Today, after almost 10 years and $37 billion of United States taxpayer funds, Afghanistan is still one of the five poorest countries in the world. Transparency International rates Afghanistan as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. 176th out of 180. A 2009 World Bank report says Afghanistan is one of the most difficult places in the world to start a business. And in Foreign Policy Magazine's just released 2009 Failed State Index, Afghanistan is rated as one of the least stable, most fragile states, 7th out of 177. Last year, about 18,000 Afghans applied for asylum in Europe, nearly doubling the 2007 outward migration total. This was the largest spike in migration seeking for any country in 2008, and one of the most common explanations offered by Afghans as to why they're leaving is that people can't find jobs. This dismal scorecard and disturbing trend begs the question, what has been the net effect of United States support to Afghanistan to remedy the underlying economic and social conditions that allowed the Taliban to find an initial safe haven in the first place? Unless we begin now to improve the quality of life for the average Afghan, those dismal statistics are likely to go unchanged and the security conditions will continue to deteriorate. Everyone from development professionals to counterinsurgency experts to senior ranking Afghan officials say the shift from combat operations to counterinsurgency operations to post-conflict operations is largely dependent on growing the Afghan economy. As former United States Commander in Afghanistan General David Barno recently put it, only if we solve the economic problems of Afghanistan can we ever hope to win the longer war. Accelerating economic development in Afghanistan is a central feature of the new United States AFPAC strategy announced by President Obama on March 27, 2009. Reinforcing the importance of economic de development to the overall strategy, National Security Advisor James L. Jones recently noted, the Obama administration wants to hold troop levels here flat for now, and focus instead on carrying out the previously approved strategy of increased economic development, improved governance, and participation by the Afghan military and civilians in the conflict. Economic development is vital for a stable, secure, and prosperous Afghanistan. In other words, we must move, and the sooner the better, from policy pronouncements on paper to concrete actions on the ground. I have just one final note. We originally envisioned having a second panel here this morning with administra administration representatives but uh, scheduling issues require that we receive that perspective at a later date, probably the end of the summer or in fall. But by then, we should expect that the administration's new Afghanistan team will have had sufficient in-country experience 
to better shed light on the issues that are raised at today's hearings. Uh, so with that, I uh, refer to Mr. Flake for his opening comments. I thank the Chairman. Uh, he outlined uh, pretty well, I think, the purpose of the hearing and, and what we hope to accomplish here. Uh, what I am particularly interested in is uh, the interplay between security and economic development. Uh, obviously, much of the country is uh, too dangerous for a lot of nonprofits or others to work in, absent security officials. So I'm interested in your perspective on what we need to do moving ahead and uh, at what point <clears throat> we're likely to see economic growth and investment uh, without an, or unless uh, we have vastly improved security there. Um, as mentioned, uh, I, I'm anxious to hear the administration explain uh, their their goals and objectives as well, and uh, I guess we'll have to wait a while for that. Uh, but I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Uh, well, now we're going to receive testimony from the panel that's with us today. I'd start by introducing all of them uh, briefly. Uh, Ms. Mildred uh, Callier serves as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Office of the Small Enterprise Assistance Funds a not-for-profit manager of private equity funds investing in small and medium-sized enterprises in emerging markets. She also serves on the board of Afghan Growth Finance Fund, a $25 million investment fund which provides long-term capital to startup enterprises in Afghanistan. Prior to joining SEAF, Ms. Kaliar served for almost 20 years on the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. She holds a JD from Georgetown University Law Center and a BA from the University of Illinois. Welcome. Dr. Mohammed Usman is an agricultural economist and a former senior advisor to Afghanistan's Ministry of Agricultural, Irrigation, and Livestock. In that role, he focused on improving Afghanistan's agricultural policies and public resource efficiency. Dr. Usman has perf uh, performed similar work as a consultant with the World Bank and a number of other governments around the world, including Pakistan, India, and Egypt. Dr. Usman holds a Ph.D. from Colorado State University. We're happy to have you with us, sir. Mr. Ali uh, Mauji, sir, I hope I pronounced your name properly, is the country director for Afghanistan with the Aga Khan Development Network, where he manages the network's programs and relations with the government of Afghanistan. He has served with the Aga Khan Network since 1996 and has held various positions around the world, including negotiating and operating a large-scale humanitarian program to Afghanistan in the late 1990s. Mr. Mauji holds a degree from the University of London. Glad to have you with us, sir, and thank you for the inconveniences and, uh, that have been imposed on you. And Mr. Jeremy Pam currently serves as the Visiting Research Scholar for Sustainable Development at the United States Institute of Peace. Prior to that, he was co-director of the United States Central Command Assessment Team. From 2006 to 2008, Mr. Pam served in Iraq with the United States Department of the Treasury both as a financial attache at the United States Embassy in Baghdad and as a member of the governance assessment team. Mr. Pam is a retired captain with the United States Air Force, holds a JD from Columbia University Law School, an MA from Columbia University, and an AB from Harvard College. Thank you for joining us, sir. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today to share your substantial expertise. I'd also, uh, again, like to thank the folks at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul uh, for helping us arrange to have Mr. Mauji uh, testify through their facilities. Uh, we swear in the witnesses as a matter of course on this uh, panel, so if you would be kindly raise your uh, right hand, stand and raise your right hand. And do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, thank you. The uh, record will indicate that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. I do want to say that all of your written uh, testimony, which we appreciate greatly, uh, has already been put on the record by unanimous consent. Uh, so we ask that you summarize to the extent possible, or supplement if you like, uh, on that. We'd like to allot each witness about five minutes uh, to share with us their comments on that, after which we'll have some questions and answers back and forth. So, Ms. Kelly, why don't we start with you, if we could, and invite you to give your remarks. You do have to put the microphone on and pull it a little closer yes, to you because good. they're a little finicky. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about the role of small and medium enterprises and what that means to Afghanistan's long-term economic development and to the security of the country, because we do believe that those are deeply linked and that they're mutually dependent on one another. Jobs do have to be created. Income has to be generated if you want to improve security. And in our view, we are looking at where those jobs are most likely to come. And what we are finding is that the SME sector, indeed, is where the largest pro proportion of the employment 
employment base exists today, and it also provides the majority of available goods and services. So in our view, SMEs are a very critical part of the equation for both economic development and security in Afghanistan. Uh, industry and products need to be improved. More value needs to be added in the country. And we think that uh, that, in fact, will come if we can do a better job of linking up rural farmers and others uh, in the rural areas to more urban processing centers, distribution, warehousing, other, other facilities that are needed to take those primary uh, products and add the value that will ultimately bring the economic growth to the country. Uh, CIF has uh, done this type of investing in uh, 25 uh, different funds, uh, 290 individual investments all throughout the emerging markets. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years. So although we recognize that Afghanistan has some very unique challenges, we think that many of the challenges that small companies face throughout the emerging markets are indeed very similar. Um, and we, we believe um, that uh, you've got to approach this whole exercise not wearing your not-for-profit hat, but with a lot of commercial discipline, because in the end, only a commercially successful company is going to have long-term economic benefit for the country. So a little over a year ago, um, in 2008, SIF created Afghan Growth Finance as a non-bank financial institution in Afghanistan. We're providing growth capital anywhere from $50,000 to $2 million. So we're well above microfinance, but we're far below what the average uh, target size for some of the larger projects might be. Uh, we're making medium to long-term loans. We've got a fair amount of flexibility on how we can structure uh, those, those uh, loans so that the companies can pay out of their cash flow. So far, we've committed $5 million to 10 different loans. Uh, we expect $10 million to be committed by the end of this calendar year, which would mean that we've effectively placed half of the 20-some the million dollars that we have at our disposal through cooperation with uh, OPIC uh, through a risk uh, credit facility they've made available to us. The funds are being used to purchase machinery, to establish processing and manufacturing facilities, to provide working capital. And what we're finding is that there is, is in fact, a, a strong demand for the loans because the commercial banking sector is not reaching this level of company. Uh, what we also are finding is that the benefits go beyond just the financial benefits uh, to the enterprise itself. Uh, we've done a fair amount of analysis in terms of what that developmental impact is in other parts of the world, and what we're finding is that Afghanistan is very similar, and in some cases the benefits are even stronger. But what we have found that every, every dollar that you invest into a small company, in fact, generates an additional $12 in benefits to the broader stakeholder community, and that means customers, it means employees, it means government through taxes, it means suppliers, it means others in the broader community. And what we're seeing in Afghanistan is that after a year in operation, some of the companies that we've funded have been able to increase their employment by as much as 50 percent. They've increased their wages by as much as 30 percent. And they have um, taken what are largely unskilled employees and trained them and provided them with a skill set that makes them much more marketable in the future. The companies we've invested in, uh, several are in the agribusiness sector. We've got a licorice root and extract processor that is uh, exporting to, to China. Dried fruit and nuts that was manually being processed and, and sorted. Now we've helped them acquire production equipment, so they've got a processing line. Their daily production is you know, 20 times what it was before. Their gross sales are up 400 percent, and we've helped them find a new export market in China. Uh, so. And, and we've also got a raisin exporter in the agribusiness sector. So we, we calculate that a thousand or more suppliers and farmers and input providers are now linked into these three or four agribusinesses that we've funded. And of course, you know, the, the, the other message that is out there is that there are ways uh, to, to make a good living as an alternative to, to poppy cultivation. We are, we've got two companies that are producing construction inputs in the country. So instead of importing circuit panel boxes and metal pipe, uh, they're being fabricated locally in Afghanistan going into construction projects so that more value, again, is being created in the country. The overall cost of the construction is going down. You're getting training in terms of uh, the, the workers, and you're seeing uh, you know, better prices overall in terms of the, the projects that are being built. We have a, a renewable energy company that's, that's quite interesting. They are producing wind and solar panels, and they have a, a new uh, unique design that is being deployed uh, for, for the Afghan police in their border posts. They're doing it on a pilot basis now. They've got five underway. If that's successful in replacing diesel generators, 
we, we could see in the future that this company will be able to expand to 70 or 80 additional posts, which we think is, you know, a wonderful story not only for the economic benefit of, of this production and design in Afghanistan, but obviously from an energy standpoint as well. We have a technology and internet service provider that's providing cheaper, more reliable access to the internet, outreaching to schools, hospitals, government, military, to a whole range of, of, of institutions that will make good use of it. Uh, in the media area, we've got an, an Afghan language uh, uh, local uh, broadcasting uh, program that uh, we're funding through a, a media company, and they're also broadcasting uh, to the U.S. and uh, to the EU. So the Afghan perspective is getting um, out to the rest of the world. Now, of course, there are challenges. Um, you've, you've mentioned many of them. I think one of the comments I would make on the challenges, whether it's the security or the lack of infrastructure, is that SMEs do have ways of uh, being very flexible and adaptable. They're less visible in terms of being targets, whether it's targets for corruption or targets for terrorism. They're not the big high-profile uh, entities that will, will uh, you know, gain a lot of uh, publicity, and so they tend to be left alone a lot more uh, regularly. But they are serious issues. Uh, that all of our companies are dealing with. Uh, the other thing they deal with is um, a, a, an untrained workforce, but what that means is they have to invest in that workforce, and, and overall we're finding that is, in fact, what's happening, and that um, they are taking low-skilled employees, uh, they are training them, uh, they become more productive, the wages go up, and then overall what you're, you're finding is that you've got uh, a low-skilled base that's being raised, and you've got wages that are, that, are, that are growing, and as the workforce is trained and companies become more productive, they increase with capital as well, they are able to increase that overall size of the workforce. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, you want to wind up for us? If we yes, will, because absolutely. We are going to get into questions and answers, too, and I'm sure we'll cover a lot of this. Absolutely. So I think, you know, really at the end of the day, um, lack of financing does remain a challenge, but it's more than capital that's needed. It's a partnership. It's technical assistance. It's a variety of support. Uh, and, and we think that um, overall, uh, working with OPIC and others in the U.S. government, we hope to expand the program. And we think that our initial year has been uh, quite successful and had very good results. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Osman. Can I ask you just to pull the microphone a little bit more toward you? Is, uh, is it on? Sure it on. So. You push the base. Oh, sorry. Agriculture has the potential to reestablish its historical role in nurturing growth and development in Afghanistan. However, as you mentioned, in the last 30 years, agriculture went through devastating effects most of the infrastructure of agriculture, which is uh, road, uh, uh, research farms, in irrigation system, uh, seed multiplication farms, and uh, laboratories has been completely destroyed. And as a result of all these, the, we once enjoyed, or Afghanistan once enjoyed, the uh, uh, food self-sufficiency, and now it becomes a chronic food deficit. And the farmers, due to the pressure of economic and pressure of the uh, drug lords, uh, were reverted to production of poppy. And Afghan lost its share of export of fruit and nuts in the international markets. If production base of the economy, of which agriculture is a vital component, would not be improved, the current situation of $14 of import for every $1 of export could not be continued without considerable foreign aid or revenue from the illegal crops. In 2006, the Ministry of Agriculture, with the help of donors, established a comprehensive uh, national development agriculture plan. In the plan, priorities of agriculture has been identified, that being the priority being the food security, expansion uh, of uh, horticultural, uh, high-value high horticultural crops, improving the production and productivity of livestock, conservation of nature resources. 
Unfortunately, the master plan has not been fully implemented due to the position of some donors insisting that the development plan should initiate at community and village level, that extension and research should be conducted by the private sector, that current NGO operation arrangement should continue, that focus should be on rural poverty elevation instead of focusing on increasing farm income. While these positions have merit, they are necessary, especially in the long run, such efforts are not sufficient or useful in establishing the solid foundation necessary for agriculture to develop. Based on my thorough review of general political and economic situation in Afghanistan and problem and potential of its agriculture sector, I strongly recommend that these six uh, actions must be taken immediately. These actions proven to be successful in Afghanistan during 1970s and with appropriate modification, they will serve agriculture once again today. First, the overriding objective of any project and program should be enhanced should be to enhance government credibility to assist its citizen, which is now it is lacking government visibility, especially in the rural area, is completely lacking. While all parties in agriculture should work in a coordinated and coherent way, the government must play a leading role in the implementation of investment program. The uh, donors and NGO take a backseat position by limiting their involvement to uh, advisory function, institution building, project design, and establishment of proper accounting, monitoring, and reporting system. Through this arrangement, transparency, accountability would improve, government visibility would be strengthened in expenditure of the uh, NGO's security would be reduced. Second, a coordinated effort by all parties should be made to strengthen the national research and extension capacity. Reactivate seven strategic research and training stations to serve as a hub of change for agriculture. The extension cadre need to be strengthened to disseminate improved cultural practices to the farmers and to convey farmers' problems to the researchers for resolution. Third, it is strongly recommended that a viable national agriculture credit system must be established to gaining farmer support and enabling the farmers to finance modern technology of their need. Revitalization of Agriculture Development Bank with its past proven record must be considered to function as a credit and deposit institutions for the farmers. Fourth, improving the irrigation efficiency, the rehabilitation of irrigation system, and expansion of irrigation area. Afghanistan received about 75 billion meter cube of, of uh, water in the form of rain and snow yearly. Just 20 billion meter cube of which is used mainly for agriculture with water use efficiency of about 25 percent. With with efficient uh, farm irrigation technique in on-farm water management, this water uh, use efficiency could be doubled. Irrigation line in Afghanistan is about 3.3 million hectares. However, with proper investment, it could be increased to 5 million hectares. Prior to the Russian invasion, there were several new projects in the investment pipeline, such as Khushtepa, diverting water from Omudaria and irrigating 600,000 um, hectares, uh, which were halted due to political unrest. These projects need to be reconsidered for investment. F fifth, farmers should be encouraged to organize themselves in production, marketing, processing, and water use their associations. Six, consideration should be given to procurement of food and rations for foreign military and civilian personnel locally. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Usman. Uh, Mr. Pam, we'll be happy to hear your remarks. Uh, Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to participate in this important hearing on U.S. promotion of the Afghan economy. I know your time is limited, so let me start with a summary. I recommend that we adopt an approach to economic development and governance assistance to Afghanistan, emphasizing three pillars, an orientation towards Afghan public finance and budgets as a strategic focal point for the entire civil side effort, 
Two, the collaborative development with relevant Afghan experts of roadmap setting out a few high-impact programs in key sectors such as agriculture. And three, a greater use of catalytic financial instruments to share risk with Afghan entrepreneurs. The written testimony I've submitted places the significance of the Afghan economy in the context of a broader legitimacy crisis of the Afghan state that has at least three other and arguably more important dimensions. Security, namely the state's inability to protect the population. Political, the reluctance of a critical mass of Afghans to identify politically with their government and governance, the government's difficulty performing basic governmental functions and delivering essential services. I thought the centrality of legitimacy to the current crisis was worth discussing at some length in my written testimony. First, because it helps explain why past U.S. and international uh, civil side assistance to Afghanistan has, been so, has had so limited an impact as to be, in Secretary Clinton's word, heartbreaking. If the problem is legitimacy, Afghan actors failing to do things Afghans expect them to do, then it shouldn't be surprising that international civilians trying to do those things directly, the default international approach for reasons I discuss in my written testimony, has not worked as a solution. As an aside, please uh, note that all of my comments relate to the civilian and not the military effort, although I suspect there are points of overlap when noted military experts, experts like John Noggle publish op-eds with titles like, we can't win these wars on our own. The second reason it's worth framing things in terms of legitimacy is that seeing the Afghan crisis as a, as, a, as a problem of legitimacy explains why improving the situation requires us to adopt approaches that deliberately structure international efforts in, a ways, in ways that improve Afghan legitimacy by helping Afghans implement their priorities through their institutions, despite the many frustrations and inefficiencies of such an approach. This legitimacy analysis leads directly into the three-pillar strategic concept for civil side assistance that my colleagues Don LaBerry of USAID, Claire Lockhart of the Institute for State Effectiveness, and I developed this spring, which my written testimony describes in further detail and which was also referenced by Patrick Cronin of the Institute for National Security Studies in his May 19th testimony to the subcommittee. As already mentioned, these three pillars are an orientation toward Afghan public finance and budgets as a strategic focal point for the civil side effort, the collaborative development of new roadmaps for key sectors, and a greater use of catalytic financial instruments to share risk with Afghan entrepreneurs. I'll return to the public finance pillar in a moment, but there's more on all three pillars in my written testimony. More important for this discussion is the common idea underlying the concept as a whole the requirement to use Afghan institutions or business enterprises as the focal point for international assistance, which should better ensure that our efforts are aligned with Afghan policy or business priorities and is consistent with Afghan institutional capacity, thus increasing the likelihood that the efforts will both be sustained by Afghans and contribute to resolving the underlying legitimacy crisis. My discussion thus far has emphasized explaining all of the current crisis in Afghanistan, the limitations of past civil side international assistance, and the rationale for the alternative approach we've recommended solely by reference to the Afghan situation and the dynamics of international assistance. In other words, without bringing recent experience in any other country into it. I'd like to now conclude by describing briefly how the U.S. experience in Iraq reinforces both the general component of this analysis and the feasibility and effectiveness of the particular solution proposed. While Afghanistan and Iraq are indeed apples and oranges in many respects, perhaps no more so than in public finance and economic terms, where Afghanistan ranks near the bottom in terms of wealth and human capital indicators, and Iraq has the second largest proven oil reserves in the world, the Afghanistan and Iraq efforts do have one major factor in common, us. In both countries, the same U.S. and U.K. civilian and military organizations operate according to broadly similar organizational dynamics, setting the stage for the same kinds of misalignment with local country priorities and institutional capacity and the same tendencies towards a fragmented international effort. Indeed, I'm sure you'll all recall that in 2004 and 2005 and 2006, the Iraq effort was routinely condemned as seriously, perhaps even fatally hindered by coordination challenges between civilians and the military, between different civilian agencies, and most importantly, between the U.S. efforts and the Iraqis themselves. I, I think that, that those stories about those coordination challenges are f familiar to us from both uh, efforts. Uh, both official audits and journalistic accounts produced story after story about how the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing and all the ways in which this was undermining our efforts to get to the point when the Iraqi government and economy could stand on their own. As it happened, 
a little appreciated but significant factor in addressing some of the most important coordination problems and improving the effectiveness of our efforts to support Iraqi self-governance was a belated recognition of the strategic importance of Iraqi public finance, particularly budgets. This led to a significant shift in emphasis across the entire U.S. assistance effort towards helping Iraqi officials at both national and provincial levels execute Iraqi budgets. As recounted in the capstone report of the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, Hard Lessons, in 2006, most Americans in Iraq were still focused on spending U.S. money largely independent of Iraqi government institutions. Consequently, in many cases, there was a lack of sufficient Iraqi participation in deciding how or what to reconstruct and ensuring that projects could be maintained afterwards. The end of 2006, however, saw, quote, the rise of budget execution as, US civilian, as, a, civili as a U.S. civilian and military priority. By mid-2007, the standard for a useful expenditure of U.S. funds had largely shifted to, quote, if it can't be done by Iraqis, we probably shouldn't do it. What is better is a project that takes 60 days instead of 30 days, but is done by the Iraqi manager and is sustainable by the Iraqis and that their operations can support. By mid-2008, Iraqi public finance and budgets had become such a central organizing principle to the U.S. effort that the embassy and multinational force Iraq created a civil military public financial management action group known as the PIFMAG, chaired by the senior civilian and military leaders responsible for governance and the economy and incorporating the participation of dozens of U.S. organizations working on the civil side in Iraq in order to ensure that all civilian and military personnel, whether working with ministries from Baghdad or with provinces from provincial reconstruction teams, would make assisting with the execution of Iraqi budgets a paramount civil administration pri mission priority. By the end of 2008, an independent U.S. Institute of Peace study of the PRTs had concluded the budget execution role is critical to the U.S. mission in Iraq and is the primary strategic justification to continue the PRT program. I hope it goes without saying that nothing I've just said should be taken as suggesting that an approach having worked modestly in Iraq is by itself a reason to adopt it in Afghanistan. Indeed, I limited my written testimony to Afghanistan in order to avoid any such implication. However, if we believe that there are some common daunting challenges to finally establishing an effective civil assistance effort in Afghanistan, which have as much to do with the international challenges of providing effective assistance in this kind of environment as with Afghanistan, we might find some value in the idea of public finance as a strategic focal point and in the broader idea of deliberately structuring our assistance to better align our civil side efforts in Afghanistan with Afghan priorities and institutional capacity. I believe that by strengthening the ability of Afghan, Afghanistan state institutions and private sector to recover from the current crisis of legitimacy and stand to a greater degree on their own, such an approach would advance our national interest and greater stability in this critical region. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to any comments or questions you may have. Well, thank you, Mr. Pan. We appreciate your remarks. Uh, Mr. Mauji, uh, again, we thank you for joining us from afar, and uh, we look forward to hearing your remarks, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to be able to share some of our experiences here in Afghanistan with you. May I at the outset also, coming from the field, uh, pay tribute to the large number of soldiers here who are fighting under very delicate circumstances, uh, and my condolences and prayers to the, the families of those young men and women who have lost their lives in recent days and in the past. The Aga Khan Development Network um, is founded and chaired by His Highness the Aga Khan. Um, it essentially works in three pillars, the social, um, cultural, and economic. The social and cultural being predominantly not-for-profit organizations, whereas the economic is a for-profit organization. And there is often confusion as to why we run for-profit and not-for-profit. But for us, investments in the economic side of things are as important if we want to try and establish best practices, um, if we want to try and raise incomes, um, uh, build capacity, and so on and so forth. We draw no profits from these economic investments, even though they are for-profit companies, and these profits go back into social and cultural development as a cycle. Um, I welcome to be able to share with you some of our experiences here in the field um, and to draw some conclusions of what we've learned as a large-scale investment of over $700 million across three pillars uh, over the last seven, eight years. And I must if I, if I may say, I find myself trying to walk with one foot uh, in, in, in a bucket of hot water and the other foot in a bucket of cold water, and I'll explain why in a second, and perhaps I can turn to the bucket of hot water first. I'd like to say that Afghans are inherently very entrepreneurial people. Um, they are, um, they've been, that's what allowed them to survive 23 years of war. 
Um, it's what's allowed them uh, to rebuild Afghanistan in terms of businesses and so on since the war. Uh, and with that comes a huge amount of hospitality and warmth. Um, and after 20 years, 23 years of war in this country, there really is total devastation. And this devastation is not only just institutionally, but it's also in terms of the country. And I think we should not be blinkered that we're going to need a long and a very sustained engagement in Afghanistan uh, if we are to make progress. Um, the second point I would make is that, you know, our, our focus and experience has sort of shown that today, we've got to move away from what I would sometimes call the country of Kabul to the country of Afghanistan. There is a lot of effort being placed in Kabul and analysis um, in, 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 in processes such as the Afghan National Development Strategy and so on, which is government-led and which is important. But I think we have to ask ourselves, hand on heart, how does this translate in the field that benefits communities, peoples, and society at large in Afghanistan? And at this point, I'd like to underline the huge importance of civil society. Civil society is not trusted in this country. Um, it's seen as something that has been um, perhaps uh, uh, under and, and scheming of, of, of the financial resources that have been available in Afghanistan. Yet we see civil society as part of the private sector that plays this huge bridge between people and government. Uh, it plays a key role in implementing the principles of democracy and state transparency and accountable to citizens. Um, it creates an environment through which various segments of population can take, take part in the process of decision making. And through programs like the National Solidarity Program, we are essentially molding what has been traditional Afghan civil society in their leadership, their shuras as they call it, and modernizing it, getting them to prioritize what are the key concerns around their community? Um, how are they going to implement it? How are they going to be accountable uh, towards um, developing their societies ahead? And therefore, I think the importance of civil society in the private sector um, is something that needs to be recognized and enforced in the Afghan context, particularly as we look at the bridge from moving from policy and government services to delivering on the ground. And let's not be mistaken, while we all appreciate that Afghanistan is a sovereign state and we need to build the institutions of the state, it's going to take a while to build these institutions. It's going to take a while to get the right kind of capacity to deliver. And we have seen over the last four or five years how ministries have crumbled, how corruption has come to set in, how Afghanistan's development budget has never been able to expend more than 40 to 45 percent per annum. And that should, for us should be a wake-up call in the way that we approach Afghanistan. The next point I would make um, is that we, we tend often to talk about sectors. And we say we need to invest in agriculture, we need to invest in water, we need to invest in uh, X, Y, and Z, which I think is absolutely right. But I think what we also need to understand is that where the rubber hits the road, where you start working and engaging with communities, you need to bring in what we in the Aga Khan Development Network call MIAD, which is a multi-input area development system, where you're looking at bringing in a package of interventions that are relevant uh, that come together in a way that is relevant and an equation that actually affects the societies with which we're trying to operate. That calls for us to really sort of look at provinces where the enabling conditions exist and ask ourselves, what is the political profile of these provinces? What are the economic opportunities? What are the social development needs and opportunities? And mesh them in an equation, bringing in a multi-input system that's relevant. To date, I think we've been extremely busy in Afghanistan. You know, we go in and say we're doing lots of work in agriculture, or we're doing a bit of work in microfinance. Um, roles are sometimes confused in provinces between the PRT, between civil society actors, between government, because there's no clear vision that really binds people together in a coherent fashion. The next point I would make also is we need to continue to encourage public-private partnerships. Today, we're running a hospital with the French Medical Institute for Children, which has just received the first ever in the history of Afghanistan, as far as we know, ISO the PPP with the French government, with the Afghan government, with two French NGOs and the AKDN. And we're able to deliver quality health care in the of government. And we need to encourage much, much more of the PPPs, um, which have shown success. Let me quickly turn to some of what I've addressed in the testimony, and, and that is 
you know, my other, my other foot, which is in the cold bucket. And let me turn to the business side of things. If you look at business, at the whole business angle, I mean, we spent a year doing research before we held the Enabling Environment Conference in Afghanistan that really asked the deep questions, what is impeding civil society and, and business um, to go forward in Afghanistan? Um, and you see there is a roadmap that came out which has been submitted as part of the, the testimony. But, you know, the issues are very, very clear. There is very weak policy enforcement. Creating policy and enforcing policy um, is a huge problem. Um, in a recent survey done by the World Bank, um, they said 14% of, of, the, of the people surveyed reported um, um, unpredictability of the laws uh, by the government, even though they exist. Poor provision of electricity. If we're going to try and rebuild Afghan's economy, there's no way they can be cost effective if the cost of energy is so extremely high um, that the final cost of production becomes, it makes it untenable in the region. So the major investments in infrastructure, water, power, elect uh, roads and so on are absolutely a sine qua non. Crime, theft and security has become a major issue. Corruption uh, is a phenomenal issue, and I, I recall a young Afghan-American uh, lady who was set up a business in Afghanistan and who, who made a, a statement as we, when we were doing research for the Enabling Environment Conference, and she said, Ali, I went to the Ministry of Finance four times to pay my taxes, my income taxes, and nobody could tell me where I could pay these taxes. And then she said, finally, somebody said, I'll help you pay your taxes, but you need to pay me to help you pay your taxes, in which case she was paying corruption to pay her taxes, and this is completely bizarre. Um, access to land has become a critical issue. Um, let me give you an example. An earlier colleague just spoke about the importance of microfinance. I mean, microfinance, we've seen microfinance be extremely successful. We have $100 million out of loans. Um, we find there is 98 or 99 percent repayments of these loans. But when people hit a certain ceiling um, where microfinance is not enough and they want to increase their businesses into small and medium enterprises, none of the banks are willing to give them the SME loans because they have no collateral. And what is collateral for Afghans today? It's land. But they can't use this land as capital because the land registration rights in Kabul are so corrupt that no banks will, will trust it. And there is a need for a whole land reformation um, and, and, and re-registration process, which is not difficult to do, but should be part of the priorities uh, that we address as the international community and the Afghan government as outlined in the roadmap there. Um, in the World Bank survey, 84% of the respondents said that the court system in Afghanistan is corrupted and, and unfair. And the Attorney, General, uh, Attorney General's office has often been associated with high corruption. Now, I can't validate this, but this is what the feeling and the perceptions and the experience of Afghan businessmen are uh, in Afghanistan. Business licensing and permits are, are, also, are also such issues. Um, if I were to conclude, Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to look at a few broad things that I think are completely uh, our fundamental sine qua non as we look ahead. And if we want to address the kind of issues that you made quite rightly in your statement in terms of the challenges that, that lay ahead of us. Number one, I strongly encourage that we put in resources to address the issues outlined in the Enabling Environments Conference Roadmap, which are clear, um, and to push the Afghan government to be able to prioritize these in a systematic fashion so that we can start addressing the primary concerns for private sector development in Afghanistan. Number two, in the wake of what is a, a, a really high insecure time in Afghanistan, where it is quite unlikely we're going to get huge amounts of foreign direct investment coming into the country, we would really propose that we take a hard look at local Afghan businesses how can we really enable Afghan businesses to flourish within the context of the constraints that they're working in? Number three, work to rebuild and strengthen the institutions of government. And in this, I would strongly recommend that in the interest of wanting to demonstrate progress very quickly, is that we identify five, six key ministries that are absolutely critical for us uh, in order to deliver uh, to the people of Afghanistan and bring in competence in those ministries to help them develop the kinds of vision that's necessary and to implement the vision um, uh, at that point. Fourthly, invest and encourage and nurture build and build civil society because civil society is already dem demonstrating a, a tremendous role uh, in Afghanistan as it has in many, many countries around the world. 
a wider investment in water and power and other infrastructure. Um, we need to work hard at enabling regional opportunities. I mean, we've focused on agriculture in Afghanistan as one of the key priorities. Let's not forget that Afghans consume 77% of the food that they actually produce. If we really want to rebuild the economy, Afghanistan should do what it traditionally was when it was thriving, and that was a land bridge in the Silk Route. Um, and so how do we open up the corridors between Pakistan, Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan? Um, we've had three regional economic cooperation, cooperation conferences now on Afghanistan. And, I, and I, I'm sorry to say we've made extremely little progress in terms of tangible outcomes. Um, the seventh point I would make is the equity of development investments. Um, so far, if you look at Afghanistan, a recent survey shows that those areas that are most insecure, where there is high military action, has received the largest amount of development assistance with the least amount of output, whereas those provinces like Bamiyan, for example, where, the, where we've had the most enabling conditions for success, has received the least amount of, uh, amount of development assistance. I think we need to readdress that balance because if there is one other thing we have learned in, in, in our experience, is that success stories spread very, very quickly in Afghanistan. And if you were to get three or four provinces and make them into success stories at a provincial level, you would speak volumes to those insecure areas in the south to which you could respond to them and say, if you could create those conditions where these provinces are stable, we would be able to help you to get to that point. Um, I would like to uh, conclude by just um, uh, making, uh, drawing on a quote by the European ambassador in Afghanistan, who I thought uh, made a very succinct statement the other day, where he said, uh, uh, his name is Ettore Sekwi, where he said, as long as Afghan institutions are perceived as, as being able to provide those basic services that a state should deliver to people, a clean and effective public administration, a functioning and fair justice, an effective police, a sound system of education, job creation capacity, economic opportunities, etc. The confidence of Afghans in their own institutions will increase, leaving less room to insurgency, propaganda, and appeal. It's the institutional dimension of security which is key for an enduring security. It is this perspective it will be crucial to strengthen and better coordinate programs already in place in these fields, and in particular justice, the rule of law, etc. It would also be necessary to actively and substantially support the strengthening of management and administrative capacity of the Afghan public administration. I would only add to that that we look at strengthening the role of the private sector in helping to, develop, to deliver services for the government and, and, and the people of Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I, I think the testimony here this morning has been excellent and, and very helpful. I, I noticed that we didn't keep anybody within the five minutes, and I think that's fine because I think we all benefited from it. Uh, Mr. Mauji, you win the prize uh, because you couldn't see me fidgeting when you got the, to the five-minute point, so we were able to get all of your information in, which was quite helpful, and we appreciate that. Let me start the, the questioning section, if I can. Um, I thought Mr. Pam uh, phrased uh, or frame this uh, situation that others also touched upon quite well on the, this uh, crisis of legitimacy concept, uh, and it was helpful to put it in that frame. Uh, Mr. Mauji, when you were talking about that issue and about prioritizing uh, different projects, can you tell me you know, what, what your view is of Mr. Pam's comments that he thought one way to best prioritize them would be work through uh, the public budget? In other words, to work with the Afghan government's budget allowing them to set the priorities and then working through that as opposed to each NGO or other entity uh, trying to go off on their own deciding what they thought was important? Um, I would completely comply with the view that um, we need to work within the government priorities. Um, there's no question about it. And I think those priorities are not rocket science. They are in health, they're in education, they're in rural development. What I do fear, though, is, the, is that there is a role to be played or investments to be made to help deliver those services. Um, so I think we do need to look at a concurrent and parallel process. One, and, and that's not to create a parallel system. Um, it is to invest in the state to build its institutions, its capacity, its thinking, but also then to empower civil society, the private sector, and others to be able to deliver some of those services, either through government funding or otherwise. Well, thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Pam, I'd like your reaction to that, first of all, but also the additional question. What about the corruption issue? We've all touched upon it here, uh, and I think everybody has a concern that the investment might not get where either the, the governmental budgeting process of Afghanistan wants it to go or where individual uh, investors want it to go. Well, let me start by addressing uh, uh, the, the previous comment. Um, I, think, I think that the suggestion that uh, uh, the government, that government programs, government efforts to deliver services take advantage of all of the capacity that exists in Afghan society, including Afghan NGOs uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in places where the government doesn't reach, uh, I, think, I think that that is perfectly consistent with uh, a public finance, using public finance as a, as a focal point for our efforts. Um, I think that that ties into a second, one of the, the second pillar of the three pillar approach of, uh, of these uh, new sector roadmaps, which would create new national programs, sort of on the model of the National Solidarity Program, which is a national program in the sense that there is a ministry in Kabul that's responsible for it, but it's implemented through uh, uh, not in many cases through non-governmental entities uh, down at the village level. And so uh, you've got to uh, uh, marry up uh, the formal governmental structure with whatever capacity exists in Afghanistan, whether it's at the formal or the informal level. And I think you've got to, the, the, the answer to that will be uh, context dependent. Um, but I think what we've got to avoid is, is saying that because a ministry in Kabul doesn't have officials uh, that allow it to reach all the way down to a particular province or municipality or district or village, uh, we should therefore give up on the state structure and, uh, and devote our efforts to parallel uh, internationally funded efforts that go directly to NGOs at the district. I think there are ways of combining the two um, but we can't give up on, uh, on the public uh, process uh, if we want to address the underlying uh, legitimacy crisis, which is uh, at bottom a crisis of what the state uh, can, can do. Thank you. On the corruption point, uh, uh, quickly, I think it's, it's a central point, um, and um, I don't want to suggest for a moment that um, uh, that there are simple answers to it. Um, uh, the suggestion that we place a greater emphasis on, uh, on the Afghan budget, uh, which uh, entails greater U.S. and international <coughs> financial support for the budget, greater use of budget support, for instance, um, is a risky proposition. Um, and I think that one would do that as part of a multi-step process uh, which would also involve some uh, intensive technical assistance work, uh, assessing the quality of the public finance systems. The World Bank and the IMF have already done a tremendous amount of work on those systems, and uh, my sense from them uh, in general is that those systems are actually in decent shape, but, but obviously the U.S. <coughs> would want to uh, uh, hear that directly and see that directly um, and do some work preparing the, the, the national budget, and then if there's going to be a degree of fiscal decentralization, uh, sub-national budgets to receive additional money. Um, some money will be lost, but some money uh, is lost uh, when it's done through parallel systems, too. The argument is that only by putting money through their system and concentrating our efforts on making that system work, which it, which it will be, you know, which it will only do imperfectly at the beginning, will we ever get to the point where there is a functional system that can respond to, uh, that, that, that can perform all of the functions that the quote from the EU ambassador just described. Thank you very much. Mr. Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the testimony. Uh, regarding the question of security, uh, how is the situation improving over the past uh, uh, several months in terms of uh, particularly agricultural production and, and the need for for outside investment, uh, but in, in so many areas of the country we have difficulty operating, or at least um, other organizations outside of government. Uh, Mr. Usman, do you want to address that? Is that situation improving? Yeah, yes, sir, I think it is improving, but I want to come to 
if I may, on the question of corruption a little bit, that you see, in once according to a rough estimate, that uh, our Ministry of Agriculture has something like 11,400 or 500 staff. And however, at this time, probably the Ministry of Agriculture system needs something like four to 5,000 staff. And the salary of these people are something like $50 or $60 or $80 a maximum. And the rent and everything else in the Kabul area is $100, $200. Then to expect that these people could live on that salary, it is impossible. At the same time, I I'm not critical of NGOs, but NGOs are paying lucrative salary allowances to their staff. There is a sort of jealousy would develop with the NGOs. The NGOs are actually getting the cream of the experts of the, of the uh, government staff as their employment. I was thinking of that. I said, okay, if from this uh, 5,000 that we need in Ministry of Agriculture, supposedly, then probably based on the selection, a good selection criteria, give them some sort of hardship allowances and put some tough sort of requirement there. And I think they would function best in one, uh, my, according to my experience, while Agriculture Development Bank at the time that it was functioning really properly in the region was uh, classified as a successful bank. It was giving, up, up, compared to the rest of the employees of the government, some 50% more salary to their staff and good selection area, and good selection criteria. And all the staff are working perfectly, and they were sort of appreciating the jobs, and the uh, corruption reduced. But if we completely, sorry, we are here. It, our apologies. These are uh, notices with regard to what's going on on the floor of the house. Okay. So if we wait one second, they'll stop, and then you won't, we'll give you a little extra time on that. If, if we are completely uh, sort of ignore that, okay, there is corruption, therefore we do not want to deal with it. In Ministry of Agriculture, suppose that while I was there, we wanted to, to bring the financial system based on international accounting procedures. For six months, I was looking for an expert to come and fix the system. It was not available. And then the ministry, and for, for something, they had something like $3 million. They gave it to FAO, I think, like if I could remember correctly, for 35% fee that they should spend it on their accounting procedures. Therefore, that accounting, bookkeeping, financing, reporting needs a lot of work, and I know it is difficult, but we have to do it. We have to reconstruct the, 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 the system. As far as agriculture is concerned right now, you know, the, as I said in, in my written testimony, that the crop production per hectare is something like 1.6 to two ton per hectare. And for the dry line, which is around 4.5 million hectares of the dry line, this is 0 0.6. The, in the regions, they are getting it 4.5 from irrigated in two tons for, from dry line. This is a staple food of wheat. But we have to work on reducing the cost of production. Otherwise, we cannot compete with a neighbor country. In 2002, Afghanistan was supposed to have a bumper crop. But similarly, the neighbors had uh, uh, more bumper crops, and the farmers would not even bother to go and harvest the crop. Therefore, the research, bringing back the research, bringing back the extension system is really, really necessary. Putting the NGO expert along with the ministry expert to, to complement each other. Right. Uh, I hope I, I address the question. Thank, Sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pam, with regard to, uh, you know, you put so much emphasis on uh, public finance and going through the Afghan government. But for a body like this, uh, the U.S. Congress that has to appropriate the money to the extent that we're talking about direct assistance, um, there's a point at which that you simply say we cannot tolerate so much money being drained off and with there's significant corruption. But uh, you, you're, you seem to be making the point that we have no choice, that we have to 
to uh, to funnel through that system and not through a parallel system. But at, I mean, give us some guidance here. Um, uh, where, what kind of strictures or mandates or whatever can we put in place? And if they're not met, what are our choices at that point? Um, because it's, it's a difficult thing, I can tell you, to, to sell foreign aid in general. Uh, but when a significant chunk of it uh, will be drained off, uh, it's tough to just accept that as a, you know, a matter of uh, doing business. Yeah, I, I understand, Congressman. I, I, I think I would give three answers to that question. Um, the, the first is what the alternative is. We've been in Afghanistan for eight years. Uh, the chairman uh, uh, gave a figure for the amount of, of money that's been appropriated to Afghanistan during that time. Uh, uh, it's been a very large number. The question is what results have we received for that investment? Uh, uh, my uh, it's my sense that, that, there's, that the, there's a broad consensus that we haven't received a very good return on that investment by the U.S. taxpayer. This is why Secretary Clinton said that looking at the effort, looking at the results achieved, uh, was heartbreaking. And uh, uh, I mentioned the uh, Iraq case because that's another case that has happened uh, contemporaneously with our investment in Afghanistan where we appropriated, Congress appropriated $20, $40 billion for civil side assistance, and it produced a very poor result. Now, so it, you're, the, the advantage of that investment thus far has been greater accountability. We, we appropriated it through the, the standard modalities for foreign assistance, which meant that it went to U.S. agencies who used U.S. contractors who were used to the U.S. rules for accounting for the money. The problem with it is that in too many, it, it, in, too often, the investments made with, with that money uh, were not synced up with Afghan priorities and institutional capacity in such a way that it, it moved uh, the, uh, the Afghan government towards uh, greater uh, uh, capacity and uh, self sufficiency and self-governance and to, uh, to, you know, in, in other words, further towards a point at which uh, we could eventually scale down our presence, both military and civilian. Um, so the first point is, is what the alternatives are. I'm suggesting that the uh, business, business as usual has not worked very well. I think this is consistent with the, the President's uh, new strategy for Afghanistan and Pakistan, which calls for a new approach. Uh, my second point is uh, is what this the new the approach that I'm recommending would entail. Um, again, I'm not suggesting that we simply you know transfer all of the money that we would have appropriated through the systems we know and trust into directly into the Afghan uh, budget. By no means, uh, I think this is something that has to take place. It has to be done gradually, um, and I think it's already uh, the first steps of it uh, may already be in motion. Um, uh, there have been some cases where, where uh, intensive work with particular ministries uh, has given uh, our agencies comfort that that ministry is now ready to receive a greater degree of budget support. Um, and I think uh, USAID's work with the Ministry of Health uh, is, is one of the examples there. Uh, but, but my argument is that we need to do that on a broader scale, and, and doing that is, uh, is something that will require intensive technical assistance uh, in public financial management. Uh, fortunately, we're not starting from scratch. As I said, the World Bank and the IMF have been working on this since 2001, have produced reams of, of, of uh, documents about it, have, 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 you know, there are detailed assessments of how that, of how the, uh, the state of the system and the confidence that we can have in it. Um, uh, and we have a further advantage in that uh, uh, we appear to be uh, in the process of s sending over a significant number of additional civilians uh, and or military reservists to focus on civil side assistance. Many of those people could be used uh, uh, to help enable this public finance focus stationed at every level of the Afghan government given su sufficient training in public financial management that they could help us track it. 
but the point is that the, the money has to go through the Iraqi institutions with us on the outside helping the institutions work rather than going through us on the outside providing the benefits to, Thank you. Thank you. to the Afghans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Mr. Foster, you recognize for five minutes. Um, thank you. Um, let's say I'd like to, um, yeah, with the unanimous consent, I'd like to um, enter this into the record. This is a um, document which is um, volume one of the Afghan legal of uh, judicial reports. Without which, objection, so ordered. Which my father was involved in um, producing in 1975 and 1976, where he essentially rode circuit in a Land Rover to the local, um, um, well, whoever it was that was in charge of making um, making legal decisions at the time. And um, it's, it, I recommend it to anyone that it's very sobering reading to understand the huge chasm that exists between a modern functioning um, Western um, legal system and what was in place at least in 1975 and has probably gone backwards, is my guess, because of the wars in the time period. Um, and so my questions to Mr. Pam and Mr. Maji are, um, what is the structure of the Afghan legal system today, and what are the useful alliances that could be encouraged to build a functional legal infrastructure? Um, are the alliances with Western or Islamic countries more, going to be more valuable in this? And if Islamic alliances are the best, with whom? You know, where are the Islamic partners that, that may have high-functioning legal systems that um, could be most easily culturally adapted um, to Afghanistan? Are you asking the question of us? Um, either one. Okay. All right. Well, <coughs> well um, I, I'll answer briefly because I'm not... Uh, although I'm a lawyer, I have never worked on, on legal issues uh, with respect to Afghanistan. Um, I would just say that uh, uh, I think you raise an excellent point uh, uh, in distinguishing between, in asking the question of whether uh, 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 Islamic uh, technical assistance on the legal system uh, might, might be more effective coming from uh, uh, Islamic lawyers than from Western lawyers. Um, and I think that that is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the larger point uh, there is that we face a general, we, we face a, a decision generally in, in providing assistance of whether we want to, our goal is to set it up to look like our system, which in many cases is a, implies a Herculean effort um, because they're coming from very different starting points, not only in terms of economic development, um, but culturally, religiously, legally. Or whether we want to focus on what's there and uh, what other uh, resources are much closer to what's there uh, in order to uh, produce uh, incremental uh, improvements. All right. Mr. Maji, did you, did you hear the question? Well, and have... <coughs> I, yes, I, I heard the question, um, and I, I think it's an excellent question. Um, I, I think we've got to divide the legal system or the rule of law in, in, into various parts. I think there are certain parts of the legal system which would, you know, uh, w w which we can associate with internationally. Uh, you know, do we have a policy for investment? Uh, uh, do we have a policy for trade? Um, and, and so on and so forth. I think where the Islamic issues come in um, is when it comes into conflict resolution uh, amongst communities, um, amongst personal um, wealth, um, and so on. And, and the constitution of Afghanistan certainly makes provision for the Islamic system to be used under different interpretations of the faith. So, for example, the Hanafi um, and, 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 and the Shia. Um, now, I would, um, I mean, I think while there might be particular areas that need to be developed specific to this case, but in the, in the context of wider Islamic law or how it's been used in Islamic countries, I think we, do, we need to draw on countries like Malaysia, uh, for example. I mean, Malaysia is an extremely progressive Islamic state. Um, some countries like Bahrain in the Middle East who has also sort of made progress. And, and, and I think your point is extremely valid because we should welcome or, or draw in the inputs of these countries in, in trying to help Afghanistan shape its legal system. And, and Mr. Maji, I, I was interested also in your discussion of the difficulty of obtaining clear title 
to many plots of land as being an impediment to economic development. As I, I remember my father talking about a, a plot of land that, that was claimed by six different people and they've been arguing about it for generations as to who actually owned it. And it, it strikes me there may be an opportunity or for us to make an, a contribution by actually establishing a central database of who owns what. Um, this is a sort of technical project that the U.S. actually could help out with. Um, and then, of course, you'd have to go through and, and make all the independent educations. And I was wondering if you thought that was a promising avenue for, for U.S. or foreign assistance. Uh, I, I would agree with you, sir. I think that is an extremely needed area uh, in Afghanistan. Um, land registration or land ownership goes under the title deeds here. By, they call them kawalas. Um, and you, you have a huge set of issues. You have corruption and fake koalas. You've had two administrations in Afghanistan, the Taliban and the pre-Taliban, and, and a lot of refugees have moved over to Pakistan, Iran. Land was taken over by the Taliban, resold, new koalas given. Um, this, this system of land rights amongst families here is that, you know, your father would then pass it on, um, equal, divide the land equally amongst your children, and there's almost there's often disputes amongst um, children as to how much land is owned by whom, because there's no clarity of documentation. And I think any effort that can be made with trying to bolster up the, the, the municipality um, and other areas of government, the Ministry of Urban Development, to look at land registration so that it becomes a credible document from which they can turn land into capital is only valuable. Thank you. Yield Thank back. you, Mr. Foster. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I missed uh, opening remarks, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you mentioned this, but in our, uh, Dr. Isman, in our um, trip that uh, Chairman Tierney and myself and a few other members of the committee took earlier this year, um, we heard stories uh, about farmers who were spending uh, more money paying uh, customs charges, uh, paying tariffs, paying different forms of uh, extorted payments as they transported their goods um, through the country to whatever port um, the goods were going to, uh, to an extent that it essentially canceled out the benefit of producing the good in the first place, um, which was uh, consequently driving uh, people to uh, the illicit trades in which um, they were not responsible for the transport of those goods. Can you talk a little bit about um, where we stand today in terms of the difficulty of transporting agricultural products throughout the country and what we need to be doing as a, a, a government um, in terms of trying to make that process easier? So. I think, you know, the situation from the time I was there has been, as I heard, has been improved a lot. And generally, uh, you know, that uh, observation that you had, it is, it is true. But especially in the case of uh, border trades, uh, suppose that the trucks that are taking fruits through Pakistan, in the several times that trucks is unloaded and loaded, by the time it reach India, it completely, the especially grapes, is rotten. And uh, lately, there has been some agreements that to uh, improve the situation. And one of the things that implicitly I uh, indicated in my paper that these farmer associations, producer associations, marketing association has to be formed because farmers in Afghanistan are small and weak. That way, through their association in direct contact with the uh, final customers, uh, then these, uh, they would find a sort of political pressure hand to, to, to see these things would improve. And at the, at the present time, we have, I think, something like uh, thousands of these associations, but they are so weak financially, uh, technically, that they could not uh, stand and fight for their benefit. I think it needs both from the government side and from the grassroots side, we have to mobilize the people. Thank you. Great. Um, let me ask a more general question to the to the panel, um, and, and that's this. I think whether we're talking about 
uh, our military or diplomatic or economic progress in the countries in which we occupy, um, benchmarks, uh, you know, continue to be a problem um, in terms of trying to identify um, our levels of success. Uh, and so as you look five years out, maybe even ten years out, to uh, the Afghan economy, what are the benchmarks for success that we should be looking at to try to decide whether our investment there um, has um, made the, the, the kind of gains that we hope? What are, the, what are the indicators that we need to be looking at um, in a five or ten year time frame that help us understand the success or failure of our mission there? Well, I think the benchmark from, let's say, agriculture, which is 80% of the population live in the rural area and their life is directly and in, indirectly in connected with agriculture, the benchmark there would be productivity in agriculture. Suppose it, you know, like we have 95,000 hectares of land which is uh, devoted to orchard. If we see that the benchmark is that to double that hectareage and according to the expert, even the present orchard could be uh, increased, the uh, yield could be increased or could be doubled, if that would, would happen, if the production of uh, wheat per hectare reached to the level of neighboring countries, then we are really successful on the national level, not on the small uh, project here and there that would be temporarily and not uh, long-lasting sort of uh, indicators that would, would make the country to stand on their feet. Thank you. Mr. Pamer, Ms. Callier. Yeah. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I with your permission, interpret it, your question m more broadly than, than just benchmarks for the economy, but benchmarks, benchmarks for appropriate to uh, the civil side effort uh, uh, more broadly. Um, the, the, the benchmark that, that I, in my written testimony, uh, the benchmark I, I suggest we use as a benchmark um, uh, budget execution performance. Um, and uh, that is, which is to say, how much uh, they are spending through their system. Uh, it is uh, obviously just merely spending money uh, is, a, is a very gross measure, uh, um, as, as we know. But um, uh, in my experience, uh, focus, using a metric like that uh, would have the benefit of focusing uh, the Americans working in the country uh, who are supposed to be building capacity uh, of, of the, the Afghan institutions, focusing them on ways to improve that, that, uh, that specific element of performance. And it's something that everyone understands. Uh, um, and it, the number will start out low. I think there was a, a reference in previous testimony to, uh, to the Afghans only being able to spend 40 percent of their development budget. Uh, those numbers, numbers like that are common in the developing world. Budget execution is a, is a problem in every, uh, in every emerging market. Um, but uh, you start with a number like that, you give the effort, the objective, you, the, the task of doing what's necessary to improve that number so that that money does flow more effectively through the system with less leakage and producing more results at the end. Um, and I think what you end up with is both a more focused and effective U.S. effort on the one hand um, and an Afghan government which is producing more results uh, on the other. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Murphy. You know, I, I look at uh, the testimony of all of the witnesses and, and I see uh, one common tie about credit availability of credit. Um, Mr. Usman spoke about it, about enhancing government credibility with better credit in the agricultural realm on that. Uh, Mr. Pam talked about the need to better use Afghan capacity, said there was plenty of entrepreneurial spirit out there, but capital was, uh, was a problem on that. Um, Mr. Maoshi uh, talked about expanding significantly the outreach of a broad range of financial services throughout the country. Uh, and Ms. Kalia, you, you talked about it as well. And, and talked about uh, the Afghan Growth Fund and expanding the, the uh, capital flow into small and medium enterprises in Afghanistan. So let me start with you, Ms. Kalia, because we haven't heard uh, enough from you. 
does the infrastructure exist to uh, increase that flow of capital? Is there enough uh, structure there for the writing of these types of loans, uh, to the administration of the loans? Uh, what about security or collateral uh, on those loans? And uh, just round that out for everybody to comment on what would a well-run enterprise fund look like if we decided to go in, in that angle on that? And then at the end, I'll ask Mr. Pam to talk a little bit about his comment that enterprise funds have filled elsewhere. But Ms. Kelly, how can you help us there? Well, I think, excuse me, yes. Uh, well, cert we're certainly, I think what we are finding is uh, a surprising level of demand. So that there are, as, as many have said, there's a real entrepreneurial culture, uh, but what, what has been missing is the ability to, to really apply that, that uh, desire uh, in a very practical way because access to capital has been, been lacking. Uh, but it's more than just the, the capital. It's also providing the various other kinds of support. We were talking about the, the need for proper accounting and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a business building effort that requires capital, but also various types of technical support. And I think we've also said um, it's important to make sure that the reach is beyond Kabul. You know, we're trying uh, at a limited way to do that. I, I think in order to reach some of the other areas, we would certainly need some uh, additional support. Uh, but it's a very important thing because I think otherwise, you know, in answer to one of the other questions, a, a lot of the, the potential economic benefit is being uh, left on the table because uh, you're not doing the value addition in country, you're exporting, you know, raw product or you're not getting the distribution to the places where it needs to go. So the demand is there, it's challenging, uh, but these challenges are not all unique to Afghanistan and, um, and I think you know, in terms of, of what's needed, uh, whether it's an enterprise fund or more for, for larger investments or more smaller investments, it's the combination of the capital and the technical assistance and then, and then trying to structure in a way that's culturally sensitive uh, in an Islamic culture as well as dealing with the constraints that one has in, in the legal system. But there are ways to do it and, and you can get good repayment rates at the microfinance level and we found at the SME level as well. Thank you. Dr. Wisman, what would uh, that loan situation look like uh, in Afghanistan that might be different than a Western loan. Um, Ms. Kali, I just mentioned it might be, you know, be culturally sensitive in the way that we're uh, getting this money out to the entrepreneurs and the terms on which they're done. How might uh, that differ than what we in the West would consider a loan uh, pr a prospect? Well, you know, the <laughs> in Afghanistan, let's say the example, at the time of the king, we had three or four specialized banks. There was agriculture development bank, trade bank, and industrial development banks. And I don't know who went there and came with the idea that these specialized banking, we don't have experience worldwide, let's cancel them from Afghanistan too. And without actually considering that there were experience that actually this agriculture developing bank received three uh, loans from the, at the time of the king, at the time of Dawood, from uh, the World Bank, and they are handling it fine. The people repayment was picking up, and the farmers were really happy in Afghanistan, uh, you know, and now all these minister of agriculture, everywhere they go, they, the people ask, uh, where is the credit for us? And in the form of uh, vouchers, the government gave, I think with the help of the donor, something like $100 million voucher system. That uh, collection of that is negligible. But the people are used to get the loan, like in here, and pay the interest and pay it back. If we continued, the government of the governor of of uh, Iraq at the time Ismail Khan was the governor. That branch that stayed in Iraq in in Iraq, he gave it some capital and said, "Go ahead, you start your operation." And everybody was happy there. I don't see that much difference because if you have the technical capacity improve the accounting system, improve the banking system, and especially in agriculture, if you connected these associations, former associations, with, put them in the board of the bank, and put them in, eventually, probably they would be the owner of the bank, it would be, it would be really a, 
good system. It, uh, the system is working here in some other countries that I had seen is working. Suppose that I was working with Egypt. They were the Agriculture Development Bank there. They were getting giving $5 billion a year as lending to the farmers and to the agro-business people. And they were successful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Thank you. Um, Mr. Osman, just follow up. Um, how, to what extent are the uh, NGOs that are operating locally uh, uh, purchasing food from local vendors and, uh, and well, uh, farmers? Uh, I, there was for national uh, security purposes, I think at one time, they, if I can remember correctly, they b bought something like 10,000 or 15,000 tons uh, f f locally, but NGOs, so far, I, as far as I see, they don't buy from local market. And that, that is a difficulty, is that uh, I say there is an uh, international market right in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, that the soldiers are there and the uh, foreign community is there, then if we build those standards, laboratory facilities, certificates, and, and, and all the documents, uh, then, you know, that would open up for Afghanistan product inside the country, and then later on, like FDA, you could, uh, they could establish to make the quality control check for the both domestic and international. Right now, uh, the difficulty is that even wheat that is, uh, is that uh, the, the flour is imported from the neighboring countries in Afghanistan. Thank you. Mr. Pam, how realistic is it uh, to, to move uh, significantly from poppy production um, over a sustained period of time. Um, and, and in that question is, is the problem where it seems that the, the government is, has certainly, I, I sensed it in the couple of visits that I've made to Afghanistan from the first visit to the second visit, there seemed, at least with the president's office, less of a commitment to fight um, the drug war, if you will, and uh, to uh, less of Less, a lot less candor in terms of uh, what's going on outside of Kabul. Um, to what extent, I mean, how difficult is it going to be to, to offer the incentives? How long is it going to take to, to move to, whether it's pomegranate or whatever else, uh, to, to offer something sustainable, uh, particularly if the government doesn't seem as committed as perhaps they should be uh, to move away from poppy production? Um, Congressman, I, uh, um, I, I am not an, an expert on the agricultural uh, uh, sector and uh, in that issue. Um, and, and in terms I, of the government, uh, yeah. though, in, in terms of uh, the government's commitment there, do you sense, and this goes back to the problem of how much do we run these programs through the government, um, do you sense an increased commitment or lessened commitment over the last couple of years to to transition away from from poppies, I'm I'm not sure. I okay. I, I haven't had any discussions with the government on on that subject. All right. Mr. Sorry. Hirschman, you look like you're itching to no. to uh, answer that. Go ahead. I think I think, uh, based on my experience, the government is fully committed to uh, actually find alternative to poppy production, but. We have to, you know, there is one commitment on the paper. One, actually, the uh, work would be done. But the government, you, we have to build the infrastructure of the government to actually conduct that activity. The infrastructure is not there. There was, at the time of King, in the time of Dawood, we have 26, 24 research stations, 14 sub-research in seven main research stations. None of those research stations is working. You have to improve seed, you have to uh, produce seedling somewhere. You know that for this time, it might be a good idea to provide free seedling for the farmers. And then you have to provide proper technical support packages to the farmers, how to they grow. There is new varieties of almond that would bear fruit, I think, in uh, three to five years. 
then with that, then you have to uh, teach the farmers how to do mixed farming. But, uh, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of experienced farmers that migrated outside Afghanistan, they died and they could not pass the skills that they had to the new generation. And the government, is, is there is, uh, the government does not have capacity and means to do it, while the commitment in the, is there, but we have to establish, as you say it, the infrastructure for it. That infrastructure is not there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Mr. Kennedy, we passed you up on the first round because you stepped out for a second. We apologize no for problem. that. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We recognize Chairman. you for 10 minutes. Thank you for your uh, commitment to this issue and your work. Uh, I uh, welcome the panelists. Um, just following up on that past question, it's hard for me to think that the government's really committed to the um, restriction of poppy growth when you see the enormous uh, economic uh, value that it provides for the uh, country of Afghanistan. What is currently the um, uh, uh, percentage of uh, poppy uh, crop in Afghanistan uh, as a percentage overall poppy uh, growth in the in the world? Do you know? Well, I, the, I, you know, I have more information from the newspaper, probably, Mr. Congressman, well, as in you terms do. Of a, as it, a is, crop. it is, they say, 92% or something like that. Yeah. But uh, I think we have to give to the farmers an uh, improved package, as uh, Ms. Claire was mentioning. You know, the time I was there, even the dry fruit and uh, nuts, which could compete with poppy because in India they really appreciate and pay higher product for supposed almond of Afghanistan. At that time that we made a rough budgeting analysis, it was uh, one, two hectares of uh, supposed almond that could substitute on profit basis one hectare of, of uh, poppy. And with the value added and you would have the processing, packing, cleaning, grading, right at the farmer field and involve the farmers there, then probably it could compete on an economic term. But right now, if the, the you know, 70% of the irrigated land is devoted to wheat production, in the wheat, it takes one hectare of, uh, of poppy to substitute it with 14 to 24 hectares of wheat, the revenue of that. Then with this divergency, there would be all the time problem, and sometime for the politician, it would be difficult to convince the people to actually apply that. But if we go in this other route, then probably the government would be, you know, make their argument clearly with the people, and the people would be, that would be a convincing argument. Why, Thank you, sir. Why are we not doing that? The, the nuts and the uh, fruits. Well, that, uh, I, as, as I was saying, sir, we don't have the infrastructure to do it. The research, the extension, the, te the technology, the technical know-how of the world, we have to uh, build it in the last seven years. Uh, the, you know, I, I have well, uh, all respect for the different people involved. You know, the, as you would see in two districts, uh, the, the NGO is involved in, in uh, sort of upgrading the wheat but then the proper you. seed for it was not there to actually give it to the farmers. Yeah, but I that hear what you're saying. Well, they've done it in, in Pakistan, from what I understand. We've been working with the agricultural, because Pakistan's had a, had a, had a huge, huge poppy um, right. crop, right. and they've right. worked very hard to try to eradicate it, doing exactly what you said, substituting with right. the, uh, the nuts right. and yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. and and I can I can and say they did they've successfully done that in many parts of Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so and if it takes so long to do the wheat and the wheat's a, a, a no go of in terms yeah. of the farmers, yeah. Yeah. then I think we should just move right on to what the local people think is what's yeah. what yeah. works. And if it takes the infrastructure, that's what we need to do. Exactly. So um, I think we should listen to that 
message loud and clear and right. get with the program. And, and, and the, the, the nut processor that we've uh, uh, lent funds to is, is telling us that they cannot meet the demand in the, in the Indian market for the, for the higher value, you know, better quality processed nuts. And that goes directly to his point that the, the agricultural infrastructure needs to be there to support the production so that when you've got the capital for the processing facility and the ability to bring that value added back to the farmer level, you know, you, you will be able to do it if you invested at the agriculture. I'm, what I'm trying to figure out, Mr. Chairman, is why there the, there's a missing, you know, connection here. Why we're forcing this wheat thing on them when it's clear that the locals are not really into it. If the gentleman yield it, that's yeah. exactly why there's two parts to this hearing. One part is to talk to these folks that are with us this morning, and the second part is going to be talking to the administration. I don't think they can answer for the last seven years, but by right. the time they come in at the end of the summer or the fall, they'll have to answer for January 20th till now right. uh, whether or not they're following the wiser course or continuing on a less wise course. Uh, Let me ask I, you I, um, in, uh, just another s question on, 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 on health care. In continuation of your, your answer, you know we have 4.5 million hectares of dry land farming. If we uh, uh, suppose it uh, give to the farmers, provide to the farmers technology to, to increase the yield, average yield uh, from 0 0.6 to uh, that uh, dry land Afghanistan is getting to two tons that is neighboring is getting it. This 4.5 million hectares would come, would bring something like 8 uh, to 9 million tons of grain. Afghanistan needs something like 6 million tons. There would be, you know, devote in the long run, all the lines, uh, irrigated lines, to high-value horticultural crops. Right. But that technology, that research is not there. Let me ask you, um, in, with respect to landmines, is there a problem when you're doing any of this agriculture with landmines left over from the former you know, Soviet war? Well, I think that, is, that, that has been main problem. It's uh, the farmers are doing this with a lot of casualty, anyhow, because of the necessity. But that line mine in some part is still there. Would it be useful for us to try to get the, um, you know, physicians without borders, uh, do those who do the rehabilitative medicine, to try to help do more satellite communication, so forth, help consult with doctors there for more rehab medicine, to, so those. Uh, Farmers and their families and the like who happen to get uh, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, could, could I say something on on this uh, this point about uh, um, agriculture? Uh, I, I I think Dr. Usman makes a, an excellent point in emphasizing the need for infrastructure, um, and and I think the infrastructure that that he's referring to is it's worth noting that it's state infrastructure. Uh, the need for to rebuild an agricultural extension uh, mm -hmm. system within Afghanistan is, uh, is the need for a, a national program. Uh, this could be part of the, you know, this could be one of the, the, the key sector roadmaps just described. God, God Mr. Pan. Yeah. Can you um, get us some of the statistics on these um, injuries as a result of landmines and what it would be your proposal to see what NGOs could help in terms of rehabilitative medicine? for those farmers and the like who get injured as a result of the, because I understand Afghanistan is littered with landmines. And uh, I just want to know what, what we're doing to help in rehabilitative medicine. In but I, I, I wasn't saying anything about landmines. I know you yeah. weren't. I'm asking you okay. now because you are part of the sure. Sustainable Development of U.S. Institute of Peace um, to help us with this. Certainly. Um, and, um, and in terms of um, infrastructure, for health care, uh, there's very little um, drinking water and, um, you know, sewage. W w what is going on with that for, for the uh, farmer and for the population there in terms of public health? Can you tell us about what, what's going on there in terms of building infrastructure? I mean, you can't have much of a farming life and community if people can't have uh, drinking water. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid I, I, I can't give you any detail on, on uh, the, the efforts, uh, the, the water uh, efforts in particular. But um, I, can, I can look into it uh, along with landmines. Okay. Well. Right, maybe, uh... can, can I make a comment? Yes, please. Um, 
just uh, sorry, just a couple of comments. One uh, referring to the, the question on, on um, health and water, um, but the other one also on narcotics. Um, and and just, just to say that on the narcotics side, um, our experience has been in Afghanistan that, you know, um, it's very, very difficult to compete with any kind of agricultural productivity in the wake of, of, of just the sheer income revenues that are coming in uh, from, from narcotics. Uh, for example, we would pay $2 a day um, just to, to, to build a canal or a road to unskilled laborers. Um, the narcotic uh, poppy growers will pay $15 a day plus three meals uh, to harvest the poppy at the, at the same construction period during the year. And we really have to ask ourselves, do we compete um, uh, you know, with narco wage prices um, or do we stop our projects? And, and I fear that while the points being made on agriculture and so on are absolutely valid and, I, and we believe that the infrastructure needs to come into place in terms of improving the agricultural prospects, um, we will not be able to really address the narcotics issue until there is a sense of consequence for the people who grow it. And I fear that there is a, a large amount of impunity at this point in time. Um, um, with very, very, you know, we've got various carrots. Uh, but very, very little stick for the, for, to, to stop them. And um, experience has also shown that large-scale eradication doesn't really help. I mean, it, it, it makes the poorer poorer. It doesn't affect the rich. So we really need to look at a multi-pronged strategy that looks at targeted eradication, um, but that also uh, looks at naming and shaming commanders, uh, interdicting routes that are, that are quite traditional. And I mean, I can tell you in areas where we operate in northeastern Afghanistan, um, you know, people, farmers, are able to tell us what time, how much narcotics is going to cross at what point in the border. And the reason they can do it is because it's such common knowledge. It's, it's pure impunity. There is, there is no stick to go with narco production. Um, with regards to the second question uh, on water and healthcare, I have to say that um, the basic packages and essential package of health services that are provided by USA have gone a long way in terms of reaching out um, to basic healthcare in the villages. The whole notion of water has been less well tackled, yet it's one of the smaller investments that one makes, $100,000, dollars um, in, in a village or a cluster of villages, and you drop child morbidity by about 40 or 50 percent. And it's something that we've been pioneer not pioneering, but certainly advocating for with, with, with other colleagues working in Afghanistan, that doing basic water supplies um, is extremely important. But the government also needs to look at the whole issue of water supply in a much broader policy policy level um, as to how we're going to tackle the needs for water in what is a very, very diverse geographic landscape in Afghanistan, from you know, the Pamirs and the Hindu Kush going north, northeast, to almost a desert situation in the south, where the, 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 the solutions to the problems are going to be very different. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy, for your, your questions. They were well, well placed. Uh, one of the interesting notes that our expert on the staff here has just pointed out, the $37 billion spent in Afghanistan is $37 billion, less than 1% has gone to agriculture, less than 1%. Uh, and that was 80% of the, of the economy. So uh, I, I, for all of our witnesses, I guess the staggering point, if I can speak for Mr. Flake as well, to us would be who's doing the central planning here? Who's, who's doing the overarching view of what uh, needs to be done that's important? Who's, who's deciding what projects uh, are the ones that ought to be uh, prioritized uh, and then making sure that something gets done. I, I know the Aga Khan has done significant work there. They're the, uh, the largest private investor in Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, uh, is there any functioning entity, uh, a comprehensive planning group that pulls all of the NGOs, all the private investors, all the government investors together uh, and says this a simple thing like spending a couple hundred thousand dollars on a cluster of villages uh, is going to be that helpful for public health, who talks about the landmines, uh, and what we might do on that effort, who talks about putting more than 1% of all the money that's coming in uh, toward 80% of the prospect, who talks about, uh, as Ms. Scalier indicates, you know, getting more capital into flow. Uh, just from each of the four of you, very briefly, because I, I understand we're back in session on the floor, but what do you know about whether or not that kind of an entity exists, what their work has been doing, uh, or what's been planned in that regard? I'll start with you, Mr. Maushi, please. Um. Uh, it's a very, very valid question. I, I have to say that there is much uh, better and increased coordination um, in recent months, uh, particularly under the, the leadership of the United Nations. 
Um, and I think the UN, together with the governments of Afghanistan, have tried to look at much more concerted, coordinated mechanisms that allow us to be more accountable, but also look at specific priorities uh, within, within the rural areas. But I have to say that with a caveat, because I, I do believe that while there, there's a lot of rhetorical thinking and coordination about it, um, we don't really today have a Kandahar Development Forum or we don't have a, uh, a Helmand Development Forum or a Barachan Development Forum that sits in Kabul, that sits in the province in a systematic fashion and says, what is the package that we need to bring in um, and how is this investment going to come in to make, uh, to make a real difference to the quality of people's lives? Thank you. Ms. Callier. I, I would have to say that um, you know we have worked fairly independently in terms of what we've done. Uh, we've we've gotten uh, you know good support in terms of uh, access to the the credit line that uh, we're now uh, using for for lending through through OPIC. Uh, but in terms of uh, you know broad-based interaction on the on the ground with the aid agencies, there there really hasn't been much. We we try to stay in contact, but trying to figure out what exactly you're you're asking what that strategy is. It's not. It's not. I'm a not exactly process. saying it's your responsibility because I commend no, the no, work I, that no, you do. No, no, I think that's right. But I, th but but I think. But the fact of the matter is, commending the work that you do, you may not be doing the highest priority work for that society. So as much as you're doing it, as well as you're doing it, and as hard as your, yeah, exactly. uh, your effort is, exactly. nobody has helped you focus on what their needs are. It's I staggering. mean, I, I think I think there there can be more coordination for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Doctor Usman. Yes, sir. I actually was working in the Ministry of Planning before the Russian invasion. And at that time, one, it was our responsibility that to see that priorities taken into consideration, and based on the priorities, we allowed the budget and then control the budget quarterly, how much they spend, how much work is accomplished. But that ministry now, I think they call it Ministry of Economy, and that is getting quite weaker and and probably could not do this job. And the, at the time I was there, President Karzai's government under the professor that came by the by name of Isak Nadiri, they were doing that job, but they didn't have that many expertise to actually conduct that job properly. Now the UN, with the help of Afghans, are doing it. I think, as you, uh, I think it is really uh, a, a good uh, step to actually create something like that to actually see and coordinate the activity even in each ministry there should be you know like one of the difficulties we had in ministry of agriculture there were 20 donors in each one of them based on their country policy one of them going one direction another going another direction and another going another direction there was not that much coordination and there was not that much capacity to coordinate within that ministry and I think that should has to be done and that capacity has to be strengthened in the macro level and also in the micro and the sectoral level. Thank you, sir. Part of my understanding is that Mr. Holbrook is supposed to be working in this, uh, in this effort and we will certainly want to find out how that's going. Uh, Mr. Pam, do you want to just wrap that up with Mr. I, Flake's indulgence? Yeah, I, I thank you for, for the question. I think, it's, I think it, is, it is one of the most important questions that we have to ask um, and I agree with with uh, uh, the way Dr. Uh, Usman has just fra framed it. Um, I, I address this in my written testimony. When development intervention A is the priority for donor X and development intervention B is the priority for donor Y, and in the case of Afghanistan, you have to multiply that. You have, you know, A through Z, double A through double Z, to, inc to include all of the countries, all of the NGOs operating in the country, uh, what you have is everyone doing A through Z and a double A through double Z, and, uh, and, and, and a very incoherent approach. Now, in theory, uh, you could have an international body like the, like the UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan performing that coordination fun coordinating function, and UNAMA has tried. But uh, UNAMA doesn't have the authority to uh, direct uh, the programs of individual donors. Um, and so my conclusion is that the only way to accomplish that kind of coordination is to fall back on the entity that has the strongest uh, 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 authoritative claim to be responsible for coordinating and prioritizing, which is the government of Afghanistan itself. 
the, the system worked when it was the, government, the Ministry of Planning uh, uh, working, um, but the Ministry of Planning, the Ministry of Finance have been taken out, have been disempowered. Um, and, and my recommendation to, to focus on Afghan public finance and budgets is in part uh, 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 motivated by uh, the desire to find a way to put them back in the loop in order, in, in, in substantial part, to solve this coordination problem. I guess that's part of the tension, you know, that we find up here. Um, if we were to look at trying to put the money through the Afghan government because that's a way of coordinating around their budget priorities, but then to see that one of their priorities is to weaken those very agencies that would probably be best at coordinating all of the various efforts sort of puts a conflict up there. And the Karzai government in particular, weakening those agencies, as uh, Mr. Marji said, uh, you know, having no punitive aspect at all to those people that are uh, transporting the opium, you know, like uh, not necessarily the growers, but those on the chains above that, just letting them get away with impunity. Those kinds of decisions make it difficult for us up here to say, okay, let's put all our eggs in that basket. Uh, it seems to us that's going to take a lot of work, particularly where Dr. Usman had testified earlier, uh, a lot of that human capacity no longer exists. Uh, they're either moved out of country for fear of their physical condition or their families have been killed in some of the conflicts or have gone because there were no jobs, nobody was taking advantage of their skills and, and moved on. So, well, may, may I just throw in one more? One more frustration? It, sure. It, it, right well, <laughs> a, a, a potential part of the problem, which is I understand your reservations about putting all your eggs in, in a basket uh, that you have you know, finite confidence in. But this is why I think that part of the solution might lie with fiscal decentralization. And, uh, uh, you know, in my terms, creating multiple entities right. uh, that have budgets and that have some – that are closer to the people um, and that have responsibility for providing some of the – performing some of the governmental functions, providing some of the, the, the essential services, that then creates a, a competitive environment where we're not solely reliant on the national government. We, neither we nor the people of Afghanistan are solely reliant on one government and instead can sort of go to multiple governments and, and, and try to encourage at least some of those governmental entities to perform. And I guess that focuses the even more importance on – the number of civilians and the nature of the civilians' experience that the President has recommended sending in as well as other members of the international community are sending in. Mr. Flake, do you have any further questions? No further questions. Just to comment, you, I think you hit on the, the most relevant point here. There seems to be, uh, from the testimony, a need, and, and we've heard this again and again and again, I think, for greater coordination. And so I'm very anxious to hear the administration's plan. Uh, come the fall, I hope that they're monitoring this hearing uh, to get a taste of uh, of your testimony and, and what you've said here. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Uh, thanks for your participation in, in the hearing and your ideas. I want to thank all of our witnesses. Mr. Mauji, thank you from afar. Uh, we've really benefited from having your expertise and uh, congratulate you on the work that your agency is doing in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, all the witnesses that are here today, thank you very, very much for your, both your written testimony, your conceptualizing of this, helping us frame the, the questions as well as look at some of the answers and the time spent here this morning. Uh, I agree with my colleague, Mr. Flake, that we want to really grill the administration on where they are and where they're going on this. But I think we might expand it out, too, as to where some of the international organizations are, are playing in on this. Where is the U.N. in terms of coordination? What other international agencies might be uh, playing a role in that or at least uh, if Mr. Pam says that nobody seems to have the authority uh, to do it, who has had the capacity to step up and to suggest that we all volunteer to work together and set some framework up for that? So again, thank you very much. We were uh, privileged by your testimony and appreciate it a great deal. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.